Judiciary Chairman Jerry Nadler vows to hear testimony from Don McGahn, even if it means going to court. A Fox News host reportedly wants a war criminal or two or three pardoned. And could Republican Congressman Justin Amash change parties? So Team Rising is here to going to try to make sense of it all. Swin Subasana, I can't say it, is a White House reporter for the give you Daily pass. Beast. Lauren Claffey <laughs> is the Republican What's strategist. I never said his, I always say his first name. <laughs> is a Republican strategist. She previously worked at DHS as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs. Welcome to you both. Swin, first give us a correct pronunciation on your last uh, name. Aswin Subsang, but from now on, just call yeah. me Swin. Like Swin. Cher. Right. Just like the... Yeah. You the, only you're need not the is, I've never called him by his last name ever. <laughs> 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 All right, Swin, tell us what is going on in terms of the White House response to these subpoenas. They, President Trump has vowed to block every single one of them. Don McGahn decided not to show up there. It's part of a concerted strategy. Why is the president concerned or even aggravated to have Don McGahn go up before the House Judiciary Committee? Well, it's because they're employing the same strategy that they've been employing at this point for many weeks and uh, several months now. Uh, long before the uh, Democrats stepped into power in the House, uh, and before the torrent of subpoenas were issued and the investigations were officially launched. Um, as we reported the Daily Beast several uh, months ago, the, President Trump uh, gathered his uh, legal teams, both outside counsel and in-house White House counsel, mm -hmm. for several meetings uh, in different parts of the White House. And all those times, he impressed upon them that, OK, once the Mueller report actually is finished and transmitted to DOJ, um, we know that when the Democrats likely take the House, uh, they are going to weaponize not just the findings of it, but come after basically everything that has to do with the Trump political and business empire. So our strategy from the get-go is going to be a very Michael Corleone-esque mm -hmm. um, uh, re response to the wave of investigations and subpoenas. Uh, my answer is nothing, not even the money for the uh, um, gambling fee. Right. So. Um, they, really what they're doing is incredibly expected if you've been tracking what the president's close allies or administration officials have been saying for months. Um, it's a strategy of stonewalling, suing, counter-suing, and uh, just doing everything they can to hand over not a shred of paper that they don't need to and not a, offer up a single witness uh, that they don't want to. They, they do not see the Democrats as acting in good faith here. And um, and are treating them as just uh, rancid political enemies. Mm. Lauren, on the McGahn piece, he was supposed to testify yesterday. Obviously, didn't show up because the president didn't want him to. Let's hear a little bit from Chairman Nadler, chairman of the uh, House Judiciary Committee, on that. Let me be clear: this committee will hear Mr. McGahn's testimony, even if we have to go to court to secure it. We will not allow the president to prevent the American people from hearing from this witness. When this committee issues a subpoena, even to a senior presidential advisor, the witness must show up. Our subpoenas are not optional. And to what Swin is saying, the president and his team strategy has basically been to stonewall and try to run out the clock. That's what we keep hearing over and over again. But it seems like the courts are actually moving a lot faster here than people anticipated. Democrats had a big victory a couple days ago uh, with accounting financial records. Oral arguments are going to be heard today on uh, Deutsche Bank records. So is that run out the clock strategy going to be effective? And what I've heard from legal experts is that it would be because even through the appeals process, it's not just this first court hearing, right, and uh, and uh, the District of Columbia uh, was at the 10th, right, mm -hmm. um, which is historically a more liberal court, and so it's going to move a little bit quicker. They're more incentivized to put these on the docket. Um, the appeals process, though, and the, we expect this to go all the way to the Supreme Court because fundamentally what they're doing is trying to challenge Congress, Congress's authority on what they to view as political right. attacks. Right. So is it... Um, investigations to a legislative aim, which is the constitutional responsibility of oversight of Congress, or is it um, political intent that they view as unconstitutional? And so that's going to be the question that they want to put before the Supreme Court at some point. Every timeline I've seen that pushes it back past the 2020 elections, that it's going to be at least a year and a half before the Supreme Court would even take it up. That could be expedited, of course. I mean, mm -hmm. who knows how the courts And SCOTUS doesn't work. have to take it up either. And they do not have to take it up. 
I mean, an another thing that's pretty funny here is a lot of these appeals are going to go through D.C. Circuit, where the right. Chief Justice is it's a guy Merrick you may Garland. have heard of named Merrick Garland. Right. So there's that. Yeah. I mean, so wait, is, 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 isn't the White House, I mean, it, it is almost correct in a certain way, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they're looking at this as an impeachment process. Impeachment in another name. They're, they're getting everything in place for an inquiry. So if they get the documents, they're going to impeach. If they don't get the documents, they are going to impeach. So their strategy from the get-go might actually be correct, which is don't at least give them the rope to hang you with, and if they're going to impeach you anyways, then let's fight it on this, which is mer less merit, mer mer meritorious. That's the true. Word. Yeah. True. And but the administration is also doing not just the White House, but sometimes it seems like the entirety of the Trump administration is doing this not just on stuff that has to do with. Um, um, top conservative bet noirs like Trump Russia stuff or Mueller report related stuff. But for instance, um, the White House, not just the White House, the administ uh, different parts of the administration have been doing this on Puerto Rico and documents mm -hmm. requests from Capitol Hill Democrats who mm -hmm. have been trying to figure out exactly what happened in preparation during and the aftermath mm -hmm. of um, uh, the storms that ended up killing thousands of Americans, in which um, the Democrats have routinely accused President Trump of exacerbating the suffering and pain and thus death of that island. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not just on things that uh, are, are of particular annoyance to the president. There are actual, literal life and death matters of which this administration is seeing no need um, to comply with uh, any shred of congressional oversight. Well, That's a good point. There's also, there's also a tantalizing new um, detail reported out by the Washington Post that there was a confidential draft IRS memo that said tax returns have to be given to Congress. Pretty much end of story, which very much uh, contradicts what the administration's position on this has been, of course. Yeah, I think the media is making a little bit too much of this memo, frankly, because it's fitting into a narrative that they want to push. Um, it was a draft memo that was not reviewed, so it's a single legal opinion produced by a lawyer within IRS. We don't know who that lawyer was. We don't know his political affiliation, career versus political appointee, what have you. How it conveniently ended up in the Washington Post. Um, yeah. The day before Mnuchin is testifying. So, you know, it's, sure. you know, it is. Um, but it, the language in the law is pretty darn clear. Well, what, uh, what legal experts have said, though, is that Ways and Means has that authority to request information, tax reforms without having to uh, declare legislative intent. All the other committees in Congress do have to declare legislative intent. So why is Ways and Means mm -hmm. exempt from that? So that, uh, that actually does raise a greater legal question that the courts will have to answer is, is the Ways and Means exemption accidental or was that intentional and actually serves a purpose for the balance of government? So when you have some reporting about potential partnering of war criminals and who has been pushing that and why, why don't you lay out what you found? Sure. Well, um, President Trump has, for the past several weeks, shown signs of uh, sympathy towards the case of both accused and convicted uh, American war criminals. Um, for instance, he's intervened on the case of two of them on uh, Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of those cases is uh, Navy SEAL Chief Eddie Gallagher, who's become something of a conservative media cause celeb, um, who is, was turned in by his own men for uh, alleged war crimes. Um, some pretty nasty stuff, uh, allegedly gunning down unarmed civilians, uh, knifing to death an uh, a, a ca unarmed captive, uh, captive ISIS fighter, right. I believe. So, and... As the New York Times reported, I, th I think about a week ago, mm -hmm. um, President Trump in the White House ordered that paperwork be drawn up ready for uh, this coming Memorial Day or Memorial Day weekend to potentially pardon not just Gallagher, but several other guys who've uh, been accused or convicted of this type of nasty stuff. So one of the people who's been aggressively pushing this in private phone calls and conversations with the president um, over the past at least four and a half months, um, as we found with our reporting over at the Daily Beast, is a guy named Pete Hexeth, yeah. who uh, your viewers might know as Weekend a... Weekend Fox uh, and Friends host. Exactly. Yeah. Weekend Fox and Friends host and a star on uh, the Fox News channel. And he hasn't only made this uh, something of which he's sort of the media ringleader over at Fox. Like, he, he, he has uh, interviews the families and attorneys of this guy, these guys. Mm -hmm. He's made it um, a, a top cause that he's wanted to amplify as much as possible. And of course, President Trump has picked up on this via not just watching 
um, uh, through his TV in the White House, but also by being counseled by uh, Pete Hegseth on this repeatedly. And Hegseth said on Sunday um, that if Trump issued these pardons, that it would be heartening for guys like me and others in the service who want a president, quote, defending the warfighter. Um, at least the feedback I've seen, though, from the service member community has been pretty mixed. They say these guys make us all look bad. Yeah, I think, you know, I think what you see repeatedly coming out of the service members and, you know, especially uh, high-ranking military officials is that it's important for um, the process to go through, the trial to go right. through, and not have undue influence from the senior commander on that trial. Because we do not know right now what the evidence is against these men, if they were wrongly accused or if, uh, you know, Pete has a point. Mm -hmm. And so um, that is something that needs to work its way through before there is the commander-in-chief goes in and says that he's going to pardon them and then not have a fair trial on that. And I think that that's very valid concern because it sends a signal to the existing servicemen. You see Joni Ernst especially um, mentioned this yesterday that she's mostly concerned with how this is telegraphing to the servicemen and women that are serving serving right now. Right. And, you know, the code of conduct and upholding uh, the military standards. And so that's going to be something else that they're going to see a lot of, President Trump's going to see a lot of pushback from yeah. the members, veterans, others, uh, depending on how this plays out. Well, and then I, the other I think you're piece right, of this. Lauren. And that's that the key part there is the undue influence and the fact that, I mean, the, yeah. the trial has not even happened. Right. Yeah. So at least let the trial let play, out. play out before you get into pardoning or not. I mean, right now we're going off of, like, it, it's well known that Gallagher was turned in by his own SEAL team, that members mm -hmm. of his own team are the ones who turned him in for this. That's a major red flag to me, mm -hmm. but all we know is the reported details. So yeah. if there's actual documented evidence, I mean, if there's stuff like this on video, who knows, I'm based on the testimony, that needs to come out before the president is going to take any action. Well, and then there's the other piece of this, Swin, which yeah. is that, you know, the Fox and Friends piece, which is it seems like the way to get a pardon from this president is to become a conservative cause celeb and get your case taken up by some, you know, icon on Fox News. You've got Joe Arpaio, you've got Dinesh D'Souza, and now you've got potentially these folks as well. I mean, it's... In the Trump era, it seems like a lot of the news is like a bad Andy Borowitz column <laughs> uh, NewYorker.com. True. Because the reality here is that a very large part, if not the main reason why President Trump might be on the cusp on Memorial Day uh, of pardoning accused and convicted American war criminals is because a Fox and Friends host told him to do so or pleaded with him back to do on that so because like I think that. from the political standpoint is and you know I'm just going to put on my like Trump lens here. Yeah. Um, and from the White House perspective, uh, the reason why they are doing this is because their entire administration has been a play to the base. Yeah. They are trying to rile up the conservative voters oh, no, who play, who voted for them in 2016, and that plays directly into their 2020 mm -hmm. strategy. Yeah. So by becoming, so it's not necessarily that Pete asked the president to do this. Right. It's that Pete created a movement within the conservative uh, community, yeah. and so now it is a popular opinion amongst his base to but pardon that's, them. that's equally well, I, gross, I'm not, though, I'm not to sure use how... pardons for political ends and I'm not saying that no president has right. done I mean, that, that yeah. before that's, but that's also true. gross yeah. and I mean yeah. look I mean he just pardoned the dude who wrote the nice book about him like <laughs> very naked right he what he's Joe doing here no. and I mean I, 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 and <laughs> forgive me I haven't looked up uh, the most recent polling on what how the Republican base feels about mm. people like Eddie Gallagher and uh, no no I, I agree with you in large part I, I wasn't saying that there isn't a political calculation to this, but <laughs> it, uh, it, 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 it is true that <laughs> Pete Hegseth was one of the um, main guys, if not the main guys, who brought this to the president yeah. privately and put it in front of him repeatedly, right. repeatedly, repeatedly. And he did this while covering it on Fox News and Fox and Friends without disclosing that private lobbying campaign to his viewers. And yeah. you got to say, at a lot of media outlets, that would be a gigantic... That, that would get you fired. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to imagine, right? I know everybody likes to make the equivalency between Fox News and MSNBC. It is hard to imagine that same kind of dynamic right. playing out between an MSNBC host and Barack Obama as when, an example. When Al, Al Sharpton was an MSNBC host and he did, from time to time, advise President Obama, it wasn't a secret. I'm, I'm pretty right. sure it was disclosed. Definitely, I, yes. I, if I, so I was there at the time. And it yeah. was, in fact. Um, another Republican who maybe has less of a cozy relationship with the president, Justin Amash, um, uh, in interviews this year, he's toyed with the idea of dropping the Republican Party, running for president as a libertarian, and um, he is not still not ruling that out. Um, Lauren, do you th I mean, do you think that's his play here? 
I mean, if he wants to get some attention and, you know, run for president, I guess. Uh, but, but it could be, I mean, he's from Michigan. Yeah. It, I don't I mean, have it to would remind you be, that, that the president barely won Michigan. Kind it would of an be important disruptive, state. for sure. Um, you know, and. You get it, every media outlet in the world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he would. And it would, you know, it would pull voters away, yeah. right, from, like, important states. Um, but the Libertarian Party has anywhere from 7 to 22 percent of the population identifying with them at any given time. Uh, they put out a press release recently that. Um, their numbers have increased by 92% wow. um, because, and you know, that uh, the members of the Republican Party have dropped 5% and Democrats 7% over the respective period, and they're collecting these voters somehow. All that to say, he's, it's not a primary against President Trump. It would, just like any third party candidate, it would pull away votes from, you know, what is already going to be a tight race for him. Um, and so he's not going to want that. But for Justin Amash, it's not going to be any right. sort of real political, you know, gain. He's not going to win anything. He may they just get a couple votes in a lot of media interviews. Well, Swin, I mean, we heard in 2016, oh, Evan McMullen could swing Utah. He could pull or votes. Gary he could, Johnson. He could get Gary LP Johnson. At the right, time, right. Like, right. All these things could come. I mean, ultimately, none of it mattered, right? I mean, it, it is a blip on the radar. It, mm. is, it is. I mean, it's interesting I to mean, me. I mean, Jill Stein but, may have, may have right. actually swung a few of these states. May have. The, right. There's a lot of. Yeah, there's, I mean, <laughs> these things are up in the air. Yeah. Well, what I'm getting at is there's no serious chance here, and it, it is. If anything, it is a media play. I'm not doubting he might be principled. I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. he definitely believes this, but there is a lot of benefit that comes to doing this. Right? Sure, and yeah. uh, if you talk to people like in the Amash or broader Amash community, whatever that means, people who are very <laughs> loyal to him yeah. over the past years, uh, they'll consistently say, and maybe some of them are holding back on something he might have told them or that they might know, not, not gonna speculate on that, but they'll consistently say that it's pretty unclear what his end game is. Mm -hmm. I mean, they sense that he is genuinely frustrated with the direction of the conservative movement, the Republican mm -hmm. Party, uh, in the throes of Trumpism, because he's a very libertarian, uh, uh, doctrinaire conservative in right. almost a really nerdy way, like I in the sense of he'll vote against, he's incredibly pro-life, yeah. relentlessly pro-life, but he'll vote against pro-life anti-abortion legislation that he feels is the federal government overstepping right. hmm. its, its um, bounds or what he believes its bounds should be. So, especially you combine that with the GOP as it is under not just Trump, but Trumpism, and he hasn't hid his frustration for the past two years. I mean, um, it's in a way maybe even surprising that the impeachment-related tweet storm from Representative Mosh didn't come a little bit sooner. Right. Yeah, interesting. Be something to watch. He's sort of like the Howard Schultz of the right, right? <laughs> People are freaked out more about charm. Schultz. Yeah. A lot more, <laughs> a lot yeah, more charm. <laughs> Good point. Um, lady and gent, thank you both. Yeah, Thanks, thank guys. Thank you. Coming up, the 19th Amendment is a century old. President Trump has chosen his next pick for Secretary of the Air Force. And REO versus Oreo. The HUD Secretary, Ben Carson, is at the center of a mix-up between cookies and real estate. So painful. Which is a sad so story painful. of this country. So those stories, when rising, continues. <laughs>